thank you very much, Elisa Brownstein. I don't know if I pronounced correctly. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to interview you uh, today uh, for you, tonight for me, <laughs> this <laughs> evening here in France. Uh, you are in Colorado. So just before to start, this will be a very short uh, interview. Uh, this is an initiative by the Young Scholar and Early Career uh, Group by Ayafi. Uh, so we are also like starting, we are feminist economics, uh, young feminist economists. Uh, and um, actually I, I am professor of economics at the University of Lyon. And I'm very interested in the history of the feminist economics as a subfield, uh, the history of the society, the history of the journal, like all uh, the work that you have done all of these years, uh, you know, to build this, uh, this discipline and this important field uh, in economics. Uh, so if you can start, uh, introduce yourself, present yourself uh, to, to everybody, to the people that uh, uh, <laughs> didn't have the chance to meet you before, and then we start with the question. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you so much for asking me to do this interview and for your work on this wider project. I think it's going to be a very important one. Uh, so my name is Alyssa Bronstein, and I'm a professor of economics, as well as chair of the Department of Economics at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. Uh, I also am the editor of the journal Feminist Economics, and I uh, started that four years ago, working with Diana Straussman, who is the founding editor of the journal. We overlapped for three years and she has stepped down and now I'm the sole editor of the journal uh, over this past year. So that's a little background on me. Uh, yeah, so a lot of work and a lot of responsibility in, <laughs> for the institution, um, for the field, for the subfield. So uh, one of the first questions that we have is, uh, I mean, we want to start uh, to know how how did how how was your first contact with uh, feminist economics? How did you get uh, with this subfield? Well, I started. Um, I was studying for a uh, a master's degree in international relations at the University of California, and I had always been interested in gender issues and feminism. And one of my uh, economics professors, so you had to take some economics courses uh, as part of the international relations degree. He gave me an article by Nancy Fulbray called, and the article was Hearts and Spades, Paradigms of Household Economics. So one of the classics mm -hmm. that Nancy had written. And he said, I think you're, you're going to really like this. <laughs> and so I, I read that article and started reading a lot of her and others work. And at that point decided that you know, I was really interested in economic development and social justice. I could do a little math. And I felt like uh, if one wanted to have a socially engaged or impactful kind of career, that uh, particularly in the development in a development context, that economists had all of the cachet. You know, I might think about the world more as a sociologist might think about the world, I think, but as an economist, you know, you, one has more sort of legitimacy uh, in international development institutions, which, you know, I think it's undeserved, but that's the way it is. So those two pieces together um, induced me to apply to PhDs in economics and in particular, uh, I went to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in order to work with Nancy Fulbray. And uh, that worked out really well. She was my dissertation advisor. Uh, and a, a lot of my work is very much based on her sort of 
views around patriarchy and power, right? And how that affects production and reproduction. But when I was at UMass, I also became close with uh, Jerry Epstein, who's an international slash macro economist. And that's where the macro part came in. And one of the important moments that he helped me with in particular was at that time, there was a working group on gender and macroeconomics, yeah. right? Working together, it, it was organized by Karen Grohn and Diane Elson and Nilifer Chatai. And they had published a special issue of world development. I think it was in 1995. They were being funded by the Ford Foundation and they invited Jerry Epstein to participate in this project. And Jerry uh, agreed but on the condition that I could also be included. So he pulled me into this network of feminist macroeconomists that became my long-term home. You know, it was also the place, my long-term intellectual home, the place where I met, you know, one of my closest friends and collaborators today, Stephanie Seguino. Uh, so, it, you know, going to UMass, there was this confluence, partly, you know, working with Nancy Fulbray, but also meeting uh, Jerry Epstein and having him help me get involved with this wider network of feminist economists doing work on gender and macro. So what do you think is like your main contribution to feminist economics is more like in macroeconomics is more like international economics is or in uh, development economics and in particular you know i'm very uh, and i admire your work because in general we say that we have we start having women economists in in uh, like in microeconomics or like you when you work on industrial relation or labor markets, but in macro or international, we don't have too many. Still, we don't have or international economics. So, uh, uh, what do you think is like uh, your major contribution in mm -hmm. which field or? if you can tell us a little bit. <laughs> sure. So I completely agree with you, right? I mean, within economics itself, it's a very male-dominated discipline. Uh, and then in terms of the sub-disciplines, right, there are, uh, some are more male-dominated than other sub-disciplines. Mm -hmm. And so macro and international, I think in particular macro, I would say, but probably also international, are particularly masculine types of sub-disciplines and they continue to be that way. Uh, and so I do think that this is one of my more important contributions in terms of feminist economics is uh, doing research in macroeconomics and conversing with uh, macroeconomists. You know, and much of my academic work is really about the, the, the contention that gender matters for macroeconomic structures and outcomes, right? So, and it's not just that different kinds of economic shocks or patterns of development affect women and men differently, but gender relations themselves, right? The division of labor between women and men, the terms of social reproduction and the production of labor, uh, contribute to macroeconomic performance and trade performance, right? So the economy affects women and men differently, but gender also affects the economy. And I think that gender is the cause, is a cause as well as an effect, is a confusing idea for most macroeconomists. <laughs> um, perhaps because it seems like when people think about macro, they think about it as these aggregates, right? That are above the kind of earthy complications of social relations like gender. Uh, and I think also an important element here, and this is the, you know, the part that 
I think is very closely connected with Nancy Fulbright's work is that, you know, analytically, my approach really centers on how power is accrued and exercised, right? So that's the feminist part of it. I know this is another question. No, but no, it is. It's, it's not just about gender difference, right? It's about power uh, and how power is accrued and exercised both at the individual level, but also at the collective level and what the consequences are for inequality and well-being and economic development. Um, and I think that this approach, right, grew out of my work on gender but it reflects a more general understanding of efforts to establish and maintain economic advantage. Uh, maybe one might refer to, you know, I think about my background in Marxian economics in particular, in terms of under, helping me to understand, right, the dynamics of power, uh, not just in terms of class, but in terms of gender, race and ethnicity and other types of group identities. And so I use different methodologies also. I use theoretical methodologies, right? So I do some macroeconomic modeling. I also did some intra-household modeling. I do empirical work, you know, panel data, econometric type work. But I also do a lot of applied policy analyses. This is another you know, excellent thing about doing international sort of gender macro work is that uh, one gets to participate in global institutional discussions, you know, at the United Nations and other institutions uh, that have a, an important impact on development policy. Uh, and so that, you know, that is a really uh, cool part of doing kind of gender and macro is being able to participate in these discussions. So I think, you know, if I were to categorize, you know, the kind of um, uh, groups of my work, I would call kind of one feminist political economy and the economic costs of patriarchy. Another one more recently is engendering macroeconomic models and the macroeconomics of care in particular. And then I've also done a lot of work um, especially co-authored with Stephanie Seguino on macroeconomic structure, policy, and gender inequality in, in the context of development. Okay. So that's my long-winded answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but uh, actually you, you answer part of, uh, of, my, of my second question. So uh, let me try to put in another way is like, so what, is for you the risk or the problem if we forget or, or if we neglect the feminist vision mm -hmm. of economics uh, mm -hmm. if we lack if we if you don't we don't really pay attention if we don't include feminists in uh, in our analysis as economists what are what are the problems for you well, I think, you know, getting back to this point that I made about the difference between doing sort of feminist economics and maybe what I would call gender economics. And gender economics, I think of as focused just on gender difference, right? So delineating differences between women and men, for instance. So talking about differences in labor force participation rates or uh, gender-based wage inequality. And those are important questions, but they're not necessarily feminist questions. Uh, feminist economics is about incorporating right dynamics of stratification and power and how right these delineate women's and men's roles in production and reproduction and then how these are reflected in the structures and institutions of the economy that both right perpetuate these differences, uh, reproduce these differences, and also have consequences for economic um, performance. So I think it it you know the, these points about stratification and power are essential to feminist economics, but so is 
what the point of doing this work is. You know, I think about Marilyn Power's work on social provisioning, and I think that it's, you know, it's very much also an important feminist building block in terms of answering the question of why we are asking these questions and what is the point of production and reproduction and having those guiding principles affects the kinds of questions that you ask, right? The kinds of data that you look for um, and how you evaluate the effectiveness of economic policy. I completely agree with you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, because I mean, uh, you have you are being a part of the society of Ayafi for for years, and now you are editor of the journal. Uh, so, how did you see? Uh, how do you you can explain the change in the last uh, ten or? 15 or 20 years because you are, <laughs> you are part of like the the new uh, established generation of feminist economics but you know how did you see this um, feminist economics evolve in mm -hmm. the last years did you see any change that you can tell us a little bit i think you know i think that it's so it's hard to differentiate change between uh, within feminist economics and change sort of at large. And this is what I mean. I think that gender analysis has gotten more mainstream, right? It's more common, uh, particularly in, in, in the mainstream of the economics profession, right? You can see that just, you know, if you go to uh, an American Economics Association meeting and count the number of panels or papers that have gender, uh, in it. So in that sense, I think that it, it, it's also had an impact on feminist economics in the sense that we have a bigger tent in some ways that includes a more sort of methodologically diverse group of people. Uh, though I think that as the tent has expanded, that expansion has very much been based primarily on this sort of gender difference analysis, right? As opposed to feminist analysis. But I've also seen that in this process, some feminist ideas have definitely gotten much more mainstream. So for instance, recent discussions around social infrastructure and the care economy as a response to the pandemic and the centrality of, of unpaid care work in particular in discussions in international development institutions is something that I think is really the result of all these years of feminist economics work. And it's so wonderful to see. But getting back to your question about what's changed within feminist economics, I was, I was thinking about this before because a lot of my perspective on this has been affected by being the editor of the journal these past four years. And, and when I first started four years ago, I immediately became the person who read all of the manuscripts, everything that was submitted and decided whether to move it on to um, uh, review, to associate editors for review and such. And so that's been really interesting. And in my role as editor, I think feminist economics has gotten a lot more empirical you know, and that's something that we've seen in the uh, uh, work of others on the journal itself, right? I think Sheba Tajani, right, had a, uh, an article about the increased empiricism of publications and feminist economics. And I think that that's really true. I think it's true of economics in general, uh, right? Because it's easier to do quantitative analysis in terms of computer capabilities and things like that. And we have a lot more data. And in many ways, I think doing empirical analysis is easy. It's easier than theory. <laughs> um, <Yes. and laughs> it is, I mean, it's easier to write a sort of passable empirical paper than it is to write a good theoretical paper, I think. Um, and uh, some ways that feminist economics has stayed the same, I think, is this point that we brought up in the beginning that it's still situated primarily, I think, in microeconomics. 
something I would like to see uh, is for us to take on some of the bigger theoretical questions that maybe got feminist economics started in the first place. Uh, and I think I see with the energy of uh, like the young scholars, like you all, it's a very exciting sort of time in feminist economics because I think that there is this uh, sense of re-energizing and uh, renewing interest in these big theoretical questions. Um, another thing I think is that, you know, coming back to, I, I wanted to say something about race and ethnicity in particular and intersectionality. I think that there's a lot of discussion about that in feminist economics, but less research and publication. And that's something that I would like to see more of. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Good to know. I hope many people will watch this video, this interview. So, you know, uh, one little question that I, I want to add is, so a part of the empirical test and, and model, mm -hmm. uh, for you, how uh, or what are the other ways to legitimate research uh, in feminist economics? Mm. how we can how we can do interesting articles how we can publish uh, if we don't you know a part of doing this empirical uh research what are the mm -hmm. other ways for you to legitimate to to prove that our research is interesting and is you know mm -hmm. to validate mm -hmm. wow what a good question so apart from doing empirical work, I think also do, you know, I think engaging with the theory and by theory, I'm including both, you know, sort of analytical theory. It doesn't need to be quantitative necessarily or mathematical, but also including mathematical theory. So I think that that's a, an, an area where feminist economists haven't done a lot, but I think or, or could do more, it would be great to have more work in kind of mathematical modeling and, and that sort of area. Uh, but I also think, you know, the, this point about doing analytical work, about doing history of thought, you know, when I get submissions to feminist economics that are along those lines, I get very excited because I don't get very many of them. Uh, you know, we get, most of our submissions are empirical. And I think that the, there's a lot of really interesting work and opportunity in these other areas for feminist economics to go, uh, for sure. And I think that, um, you know, it also helped, well, I, I'm not gonna, I'll wait for another question. Okay. okay <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have two more. One. Okay. Uh, coming back to to IAFI, to the International Association for Feminist Economics, I like very much this first F for feminist economics. Uh, yeah. What do, do you think uh, the uh, the institution, the society, IAFI play? What role play in your career? Oh my gosh. So I, it was, IAFI was really an instrumental in my career. It was essential. It provided me with an intellectual community. It supplied to me some of my best lifelong friends, um, a professional network and a presentation and publication venue. You know, uh, my first article that I ever published was in feminist economics. And it was um, it was co-authored with Nancy Fulbray. And the uh, one of the sets of comments that we got back from one of the reviewers was longer than the article itself. <laughs> wow. I love this kind of report. I love, I hate one paragraph report. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think IAPI has has helped me professionally and it's also made me a better scholar. 
you know, but there were definitely, I was thinking about this, and there were definitely stages. I remember when I, you know, sort of nervously wandering around IAFI meetings when I was a graduate student, you know, and didn't know many people or didn't have a body of work, right, upon which to establish kind of new networks and relationships or wondering how to get involved. So again, it's particularly cool that you all are doing what you're doing with young scholars to create kind of pathways and connections with established folks in IAFI and feminist economics. So uh, a last question, and of course, then I, I will ask you if you want to add something else, but is there any advice that you want to give to young scholar or early career or as me that I'm professor of economics, but I'm now starting doing research on feminist economics. So how we can do, where we can start, what are like the books that you want, that you suggest to read or the people that we want, or how, uh, what, is the, what is the attitude or your advice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, what a, what a great question. So my first thing is uh, when someone asks me a question like that is to, to respond, stay in economics. <laughs> Please okay. stay in economics, <laughs> because I think we need feminists in economics knowledge production. We need feminists in economics education and dissemination, right? And the, edu the education of the next generation of economists. So I think one thing that, that sometimes um, happens with young scholars is that it can be challenging, right? To break into the, uh, uh, into economics, to be in uh, an economics department. Yeah, but we need you here. <laughs> yeah, and, and so that, that's my first sort of plea. Maybe it's not advice, but it's more like a request. Um, I think, you know, other areas, other disciplines, of course, are very appealing and important. Sociology, gender studies, development studies, but economics needs more feminists. So please stay in, in uh, economics. And then my other, po my other point, which I had talked about before was, you know, consider going into macro again. We need you uh, in macroeconomics, especially. And uh, particularly if, if you're interested in the big sort of questions around social justice, development, economic structure. Uh, these are macroeconomists that are sitting at the table. We need more feminists among them. And in terms of more kind of practical work, more kind of practical advice, I would say share your work, go to IAFI meetings, uh, present your work there, connect with everyone that you can, read the journal, <laughs> read the journal Feminist Economics. Uh, I think it's a good representation of sort of the broad base of feminist work going on, but also the classics. And there are a number of good compendia of classic feminist contributions, right? That you can go through and even just recently Right, Gunsali, um, Barrick, and Ebru, right, Congar co edited a feminist, a handbook of feminist economics with a lot of short pieces on various elements. And so that, those are great resources. Yeah, yeah, you, mm -hmm. you are completely right. We have a presentation May 26 of Gunsali uh, mm -hmm. uh, on feminist economics. Yeah, but I mean, a lot of stimulated and uh, rich works, and but I agree with you, come back to the classics is always a good idea. <laughs> is there is something else that you want to tell us, Elisa, about your experience as feminist economists, about the future uh, of this field, uh, something that you want to share with us before we finish this interview? Well, I think that, um, I think another thing that helped me in my career, just a, a, a little aside, was that 
It also, I think, is really useful to present feminist work to non-feminist audiences. And I think that one of the benefits of gender becoming mainstream, more mainstream is that there are more opportunities to do this than there was maybe 20 years ago when I started out. So for instance, um, I was able to, an example, I went to the International Monetary Fund and I presented a macroeconomic model that incorporated social reproduction in it. And so I was invited because the questions of gender and care have gotten so mainstream, but being able to present explicitly feminist work and in a, in a venue like that and reach folks who don't typically get exposed to that sort of thing is really uh, good for the discipline, but it's also good for me as a feminist economist right, to hone my capabilities, my arguments, right, uh, my, my, my uh, ability to communicate and convince with diverse, diverse audiences. So that's something else I'd encourage folks to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I, I re I'm really convinced that, that if, if it's a little bit easier now to discuss with other economies, mainstream economies, or or maybe people from other disciplines also thank you for it. It's also thanks to the works that you have been doing, you all feminist economists for all the last <laughs> years, the last 25 years uh, from the creation of the society uh, and the journal too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Elisa, for this uh, exchange, this conversation, it was really a pleasure to meet you, uh, hope to see you online for the next conference. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and hope to see you in person next year for the conference. So, mm -hmm. or in mm -hmm. the ASA conference in January on the IAFI sessions or in June for the annual conference of IAFI. Yes, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Elisa.